Turn your Bibles, please, <clears throat> pardon me, to the book of Colossians, chapter 3. Colossians, chapter 3. We're going to begin reading in verse 1, Colossians chapter 3. Just cover a few verses tonight. I know it's been a long week. I know you're tired. I have every intention of preaching a shorter message tonight. I do. So even if I don't, at least you know that I did. But it means the Lord overruled me and decided you needed a lot more. Think about that for a moment. Okay. Anyway, Colossians chapter 3, beginning in verse 1. If ye then be risen with Christ, seek those things which are above, where Christ sitteth on the right hand of God. Set your affections on things above, not on things on the earth. For ye are dead, and your life is hid with Christ in God. When Christ, who is our life, shall appear, then shall ye also appear with him in glory. Now, this whole chapter fits together so extremely well. Beginning in verse 5, you have a number of commands and statements about what we are supposed to do. If you want to have the Christian life that you ought to have, you just get into Colossians chapter 3 and take the commands. Like for instance, in chapter 5, he says, Mortif or verse 5, he says, Mortify therefore your members which are upon the earth. Now mortify, that means put to death your members which are upon the earth. And then he explains it. And then he says in verse 8, but now ye also put off all these. And then he tells us, lie not. Then he says, put on the new man. A number of commands. But I want to deal with those, these first four verses. Dealing with this thought of being risen with Christ. So let's pray. Father, we come to you now in the name of the Lord Jesus and I pray you'd take this word, drive it home to our hearts, challenge our hearts tonight to have our affections on the right things that we could be and would be the people that you saved us to be. And Lord, we'll thank you for it. In Jesus' name, amen. Interesting that chapter 3 begins with that word, if. Man, it's a big word. You remember in the temptations in Matthew chapter 4, temptation of Christ in Luke chapter 4, the devil started out with, if you be the son of God. If, if. Now there are some people who say, well, that simply means, uh, this if means since. But that's okay either way. It does no damage to what's being said here. If ye then be risen with Christ. Have you been risen with Christ? Now what are we talking about? Well, let's go back for just a moment to Romans chapter 6. In Romans chapter 6, beginning in verse 1, he says, What shall we say then? Shall we continue in sin that grace may abound? God forbid. How shall we that are dead to sins live any longer therein? Now notice, know ye not that so many of us as were baptized into Christ were baptized into his death? Therefore, we are buried with him by baptism into death, that like as Christ was raised up from the dead by the glory of the Father, even so we also should walk in newness of life. And then he says, For if we have been planted together in the likeness of his death, we shall be also in the likeness of his resurrection. You understand that because the old man has been crucified with Christ, that we're not to walk after the old man, the dead man, the corrupt man, that one that stinketh. Instead, we are to walk in newness of life in Christ. If ye be risen with Christ, literally, if you're saved. If you're saved, you are risen with Christ. Ephesians chapter 2 and verse 1, and you hath he quickened. That word quickened means to be made alive. Amen. If ye be uh, quickened, I say, uh, let's see, I lost the verse. So let me go to it. Ephesians chapter 2. It just flew right out of my head. Ephesians chapter 2 and verse 1. And you hath he quickened, which were, now notice, dead in trespasses and sins. We have new life in Christ. That's every saved person. 
You see, it is not that you cannot walk after Christ. You're alive in Him. You're not dead in Him. Somebody has said any old dead fish can swim downstream. Well, bless God, I'm not dead. I'm alive. And because I'm alive, I can swim upstream. Dead fish can't swim upstream. They can only go downstream. He said, if ye be risen with Christ. So the first question is, are you risen in Christ? Have you been born again? Do you have life in him? Now, it seems to me a lot of people miss this entirely. Oh, well, don't you know you've got to sin? No, I don't. Preacher, are you preaching sinless perfection? Well, no, I'm not, but yes, I am. You don't have to sin. When you sin now, you sin on purpose. You see, the Apostle Paul, when he gave his testimony in 1 Timothy chapter 1, and he talked about what he did, he was injurious, he was a blasphemer, all those things. He said, but I received forgiveness because I did it ignorantly and in unbelief. And then he says, this is a faithful saying and worthy of all acceptation. Christ Jesus came into the world to save sinners of whom I, what's that next word? Am. Am chief. Present tense. Now wait a second. He didn't say of whom I was chief. He said of who I, who I am chief. Why? Because when he sinned before, he did it ignorantly in unbelief. Now when he does it, he knew better. And if you're saved, when you sin, you know better. You didn't have to. You know, a lost man, he's controlled completely by the flesh. But the saved man has life in him, if ye be risen in Christ. Now, let's break this down. First of all, we see in this two great commandments. And notice he says in verse 2 of Colossians chapter 3. He says, set your affections on things above. I'm sorry, at the end of verse 1, if ye be risen with Christ, verse 1 is what I want first of all. If ye then be risen with Christ, seek those things which are above. Seek those things that are above. It can't be seek the Lord, but seek the things that are above. Why? I've already found him. This is seek the things that are above. Well, what are some of the things that are above? Well, close relationship with him. You ought to seek that. I think that we think all too often, all right, now that I'm saved, for me to have the Christian walk out of half, God's got to zap me with something. No, he doesn't have to zap you with something. That's already took place when you got life in Christ. So he says here, seek those things that are above. You have to make a decision what you're going to seek after. How many remember the show, The Biggest Loser? And The Biggest Loser on that show, of course, was the winner of the show. Because it was all about losing weight. But it wasn't just about losing weight. It was about changing what you sought. Before, these very heavy people sought food but one of the things that they had to do to get the people to be successful at losing weight, they had, them to, had to get them to seek something else. In some cases, it might simply be health or a better diet so they could have a healthier life and not just be trapped in a body that's worn out and tired and uncomfortable in everything. They had to work a change in what they sought. One of the things I know that the Marine Corps has to do when they get a new recruit in for their boot camp is they have to tear them down so they can get them to seek the proper thing so they can be a proper soldier. That's what they have to do. Seek. You want to be the kind of Christian you ought to be? You've got to seek the things that are above. So you seek those things. Philippians chapter 3, verses 7 and 8 the Apostle Paul gave his testimony, what things were gained to me, those I counted lost for Christ. Yea, doubtless, and I count all things but lost for the excellency of the knowledge of Christ Jesus, my Lord, for whom I have suffered the loss of all things, and do count them but dung, that I may win Christ. I know when I got saved back in 1970, uh, 1971, in the fall of the year, I trusted Christ as Savior. The first thing, I, I didn't read my Bible before I got saved. 
I really didn't want anything to do with the Bible, but I got saved. I wanted to read the Bible. I wanted to find out what God said. And every book was so exciting to me. I remember after I read through the Old Testament, our New Testament, five times, I decided I'd go back and I'd start in the Old Testament and read it. And it seemed like on almost every page, there were things I'd never heard before, I'd never read before. And it was exciting just to get those marvelous truths. I got in the book seeking truths from the book. You see, the reality is, yes, coming to church helps us. God provided the church and the gifts to the church. He gave some pastors or some uh, apostles and some prophets, some evangelists, some pastors and teachers for the perfecting of the saints, for the work of the ministry, for the edifying of the body of Christ. But dear friend, if that is all you get, you'll never be what you need to be. You need to seek the things of God. You need to be in the word of God. It is sad how many Christians go from Sunday to Sunday without seeking anything in the Word of God. And if you're not seeking for anything in the Word of God, you're not going to find anything in the Word of God. You've got to be in it. The Apostle Paul not only made that decision that all those things that were important to him before, that he counted them lost so that he could, he could come closer to Christ, he then progressed on to verse 10 when he says, um, that I may know him and the power of his resurrection and the fellowship of his suffering being made conformable unto his life. Bible truths were not just spiritual truths. They were truths to be desired because he was seeking the things which are above. God says, ye shall seek me and find me when ye shall search for me with all your heart. So I want a closer walk with God. He wants you to have one. God says, draw nigh to God, and he'll draw nigh to you. I mean, he'll get closer to you. He's not just going to stand aloof while you're trying to get closer and you don't seem to be getting. Listen, he, you take a step, he'll take a bigger step, get closer to you. You want to get close to God, you can do it, but you've got to seek the things that are above. It is a constant choice. Not only that, the second command here is found in verse 2. Set your affection. On things above. You see, in Matthew 6 21, the Lord Jesus Christ said, Where your treasure is, there will your heart be also. Unfortunately, most people set their affections on things below and not on things that are above. You say, What do you mean? Well, in our country today, it's all about materialism, how much you have. Or it's about how many, how many followers you have. On your Facebook or Instagram account, how many followers do you get? Or TikTok or one of those other things. It's all about popularity. Am I popular? Do people respect me? All you're doing is seeking things that are below instead of things that are above. Set your affections on things that are above. You've got to change your likes. You're a new person now in Christ. You can do that. Now, for instance... It is obvious if you listen, ever listen to any sports radio or sports TV or whatever that there are people out there who are, have totally set their affections on football teams. I mean, they've got the helmets, they've got the jerseys, they've got the names, they've got the footballs that have been signed, they've been to the games. They're all about football. They eat, drink, and sleep football. These announcers that they have given their whole life to football. And they think they're experts because they've listened to sports radio. They've set their affections on it. Some set their affections on baseball, not as much as what they're used to be. Some set their affections on a particular team. Therefore, and for no rhyme or reason, sometimes it's just simply the color of their uniform. They set their affections on that team. And boy, they follow that team. They root for that team. They live and die by that team. They set their affections on it. Now, can you imagine? I, I know there are people here who have affections on fishing. I, I don't understand that one bit. But if you set your affections on fishing, guess what you're going to do? You're going to buy fishing rods. You're going to buy fishing lures. You'll even start making your own lures. And you'll sit there and look at those things. Some people set their affections on weapons. 
Some people set their affections on golf. Ah, deer hunting. Man alive. I mean, <laughs> I mean, some people have got a room that is plastered with dead heads. <laughs> Isn't this marvelous? Now, I'm not, I'm not preaching against enjoying those things. Please don't misunderstand what I'm saying. But there are some people, they live, eat, and drink these things. It is all about sports. That's where their affections are at, which is why they want to be on the golf course even on Sunday, which is why the Lord's Day, the most important thing is who's winning the major tournament. Instead of what do we get from God today? We can't wait to go home. And hey, when they're playing four football games on TV every Sunday, that makes that Sunday night service real hard to get to. They've set their affections on it. They read on it. But you get saved. Now you're alive in Christ. You're not only to seek the things that are above, but set your affections on the things that are above. Now, I was an okay reader, but I was basically a slow reader. And part of that had to do with the fact that I was a radio announcer and so I had to read script and copy all the time when I was in radio. And you can only read so many words a minute out loud and be understood by people. And so I was a basically a slow reader. Now, I got saved and I read my Bible and I had other books I wanted to read as well. And I found, just figured out that one of the things that would help me is if I learned to read faster. And so I got some stuff at that time. One of the uh, Christian education people, might have been ACE or one of the others, they had a speed reading course that they gave with a little machine to help you. And so I started doing that on my own. The whole purpose behind that was so that I could read more like biographies of great Christians, uh, read theological books as well, different things. I mean, I didn't like to read a whole lot before I got saved, but after I got saved... I just wanted to devour things, especially I love biographies, man. I love biographies. I, I love commentaries that were good, solid commentaries. Uh, it would just bless my heart. I got my speed reading up to 1,200 words a minute. I went from like 200 words a minute to 1,200 words a minute. Now, you might ask how fast I'm reading now. 500 words a minute. Because if you don't keep working at it, you'll slow down. But 500 is still faster than 200. You understand? I took the time to do it. I set my affections on things about. I wanted to read the right things. I mean, there comes a time, Brother Wally, when you got to give up the coloring books. <laughs> I'm just telling you. A picture may be worth a thousand words, but you can't count each picture as reading. You, know, you look at it, wow, a thousand words a minute right there. Doesn't work like that. But, but you determine what you set your affections on. I mean, that's like on TV. I'm, I'm sorry. I'm sorry. All these building and remodeling shows and stuff. I, I mean, why don't you just go out and remodel something yourself? There got to be 500 of those remodeling shows on TV. I don't care what these people put in their house. And I'm not going to get excited about it. Because that's not where my affections lie. If you're done, bless your heart. Termites will love you. Love is a choice. When I got saved, I fell in love with Jesus. And the more I read, the more I served, and the more I loved him. My idol before I got saved had been sports. But I got saved. I'm going to tell you what. I could tell you all kinds of batting averages and things like that. I was a big baseball fan. Can't tell you any of it now. Matter of fact, right this minute, I could not tell you, since my favorite team was the Detroit Tigers growing up, I can't tell you one person who plays on the Detroit Tigers baseball team today. And I don't care. I just don't care. It doesn't matter to me. All those games, none of them, all of them put together, count in heaven. 
You know, I don't care what's going on, what all-star game, what World Series is being played. None of those things cause heaven to rejoice, but one little child saved in VBS causes all of heaven to rejoice. Set your affections on things above. You see, young people, you need to start now seeking the things which are above. Set your affections on things above. One of my favorite missionary biographies is the biography of C.T. Studd. C.T. Studd and his brothers were part of the Cambridge Seven. They were, not only did they come from a rich home, now they played cricket. And you might want to say, well, that's kind of like baseball. It's nothing like baseball. I mean, it's nuts. You can hit the ball anywhere. No such thing as a foul ball. Wherever you hit it, they got to run and get it. It's just, it Anyway, but he was an all-star cricket. You know the cricket games used to last sometimes two, three, and four days. One game. Can you imagine sitting there for four days watching these guys run back and forth? Well, C.T. Studd was one of the all-stars. There were seven, there were, uh, seven special players among the Cambridge Seven that got saved, including C.T. Studd and his brothers. D.E. Host was another one. Uh, they got saved, surrendered their lives to God, they all became missionaries to China. C.T. Studd was in China for about six years. There he met his wife. Uh, they got married. One of the pacts that they made with one another is they would never allow their relationship with one another to get in the way of their service for God. Man, they were sold out to this. He then went to, England, or to uh, India for 10 years, and then the last 20 years of his life, he went down to Africa and roamed in the central part of Africa. It, to me, it is an exciting biography of a man who had a burden for souls. He loved the things of God. By the way, every year he would get himself a new Bible because he did not want to read the notes from what he got last year. He wanted new notes for this year. He didn't change translations. Don't miss what I'm saying. He get a new Bible. I don't know about you, but I make notes in my Bible when I read it. I see something, I'll underline. I, I like that. But now that's what he did, and it helped him. Set your affections on things above. Two great commandments. Seek the things that are above, and set your affections on the things that are above. Then there are two great conditions. For he goes on to say here, for ye are dead. You're dead. What does Paul mean when he says you're dead? He says you're crucified. The old man is crucified with Christ. In Galatians 2.20, he says, For I am crucified with Christ. Nevertheless, I live. Yet not I, but Christ liveth in me. And the life which I now live in the flesh, I live by the faith of the Son of God who loved me and gave himself for me. You understand, you're not getting out of this world alive. You're going to die. You're going to die. Everybody's going to die. So are you going to make your life here count for Christ? Jesus told the story about the farmer who was very, very prosperous, said he's going to build bigger barns and all of that. He did that. He said, now I can take my ease and eat, drink, and be merry. And Jesus said, thou fool, this night thy soul should be required of thee. Everybody, all they want to do is retire. The sooner the better so that I can enjoy all the money that I've made and I can travel like I've always wanted to travel and do all the things I've always wanted to do. What about serve God? But you don't have to wait till you retire to do that. You can serve God and be faithful to God right on through. See, we ought to make one our lives to count for eternity. Although I've given you this illustration before. There was a movie many years ago. I didn't like it. It was old English. It was about Thomas More, a man for all seasons. Thomas More. Man, this, this was years ago that I saw this. Thomas More was going to be put to death because he would not sanction King Henry VIII's divorce and marriage to another woman. So he was in prison. He was going to be put to, put to death. And a friend came to him and urged him to change his ruling, and to back the king on this thing. It's not worth your life, the man said, to which Thomas More replied, the only difference between you and me is that I die today and you die tomorrow. But he said, I'm going to die for something right. 
taking a stand. Man, it's not about living a long life. He said, you're dead. Number two, get this. He says, for you're dead and your life is hid with Christ in God. That speaks of security. It speaks of power. Your life is hid with Christ in God. His purpose should be our purpose. Bible says in Philippians chapter 2, let this mind be in you, which was also in Christ Jesus. Let this mind be in you. Well, what does that have to do with? Let's turn over to it. Turn back to Philippians, the book before Colossians. And I want you to notice chapter 2, verse 5. He says, let this mind be in you, which was also in Christ Jesus. Who? Being in the form of God, thought it not robbery to be equal with God, but made himself of no reputation, took upon him the form of a servant, and was made in the likeness of men. And being found in fashion as a man, he humbled himself and became obedient unto death, even the death of the cross. Now think about that. The Lord Jesus did not live in wealth and luxury. Here he is, the Son of God. He left heaven's glory where slightest wish was the greatest command of the angels. And he left all of that to walk among his creation. The Bible says he came unto his own and his own received him not. But he didn't come just to live among them. He came to die on the cross of Calvary to pay their sin debt. He says, let this mind be in you, which was also in Christ Jesus. Put him first. Have that kind of a mind. He even told us in John 20, 21, he says, As my Father has sent me, so send I you. I am hid in him. So first of all, you're dead. Secondly, your life is hid with Christ in God. We are responsible to do his will. The Bible says, What know ye not that your body is the temple of the Holy Ghost which is in you? which ye have of God, now get this, and ye are not your own. For ye are bought with a price. Therefore glorify God in your body and in your spirit, now get this, which are God's. In Romans chapter 12 and verse 1, he says, I beseech you therefore, brethren, by the mercies of God, they present your bodies a living sacrifice, wholly acceptable unto God, which is your reasonable service. It's just reasonable to be sold out to him. It's just reasonable to live for him, to make your life count for him. So we have two great commandments and two great conditions, and that brings about two great consolations. For notice what's going to happen. He says, when Christ, who is our life, shall appear, Jesus is coming back. We need to live in the light of his return. His return was promised by the angels. Acts chapter 1, verses 10 and 11. They said, this same Jesus, which is taken up from you, shall so come in like manner as you have seen him go uh, into heaven. You see, he's coming back. That's a promise. Promised by Paul, 1 Thessalonians 4, 13 through 18. Promised by Christ, Revelation chapter 22. And verse 12, and behold, I come quickly, and my reward is with me to give every man according as his work shall be. Jesus is coming back. You say, what then? Well, you see, it's not the, death is not the end. It is the beginning. James 4, 14, what is your life? It is even a vapor that appears for a little time and then vanisheth away. You understand, for us, Jesus is coming back. Now, for those of us who die, we get to go be with him. And we'll come back with him when he comes to get his own. If we're alive when he comes back, and that could happen tonight. We get caught up to be with him. Wouldn't it be a shame to be living for self? To having not set our affections on things above. And Jesus comes back and we're not excited about it. I had one, I had one guy tell me, and of all things, this was a preacher. And it was a preacher that washed out in the ministry. And I think you can understand why. He says, I want to look for Jesus coming back, but there are things I want to do first. What? I want him to come back today. 
If he doesn't come back today, I want him to come back tomorrow. There is absolutely nothing that I have to look forward to on this earth that is anywhere close to as great as him coming back at any time. When you set your affections on things above, by the way, that is not a problem. Not only shall Christ appear, but notice what he goes on to say. Then shall ye also appear with him in glory. What a great consolation. Believers are coming back with him. 1 Thessalonians chapter 4, verses 13 and 14. Uh, when he declares, I would not have you to be ignorant, brethren, concerning them which are asleep, that ye sorrow not, even as others which have no hope. Then it talks about when the Lord himself uh, shall come, he shall be bringing the saints with him. Hallelujah. Believers are coming back with him. We will receive glorified bodies like unto his body. Philippians chapter 3, verses 20 and 21. And we will be with Christ forever. What a marvelous promise. 1 John 3, 2. 1 Thessalonians 4, 17. You look at the Apostle Paul and with all that he went through, all that he suffered, 2 Corinthians chapter 11, beginning in verse 23. Well, matter of fact, let's go ahead and do it. I'm preaching fast. 2 Corinthians chapter 11. Notice verse 23. Paul is giving his testimony about he has given himself for service of the Lord, and this is what he had to look forward to. This is what happened. He says in verse 23, Are they ministers of Christ? I speak as a fool, I am more. In labors, more abundant. In stripes, above measure. In prisons, more frequent. In deaths, oft. Of the Jews, five times received I forty stripes, save one. Thrice was I beaten with rods. Once was I stoned. Thrice I suffered shipwreck. A night and a day I have been in the deep. In journeyings often, in perils of waters, in perils of robbers, in perils by mine own countrymen, in perils by the heathen, in perils in the city, in perils in the wilderness, in perils in the sea, in perils among false brethren, in weariness and painfulness, in watchings often, in hunger and thirst, in fastings often, in cold and nakedness, beside those things that are without, that which cometh upon me daily, the care of all the churches. Do you remember his prayer? That I may know him and the power of his resurrection and the fellowship of his what? Sufferings. I believe Paul got his prayer answered. It's funny, at the end of chapter 1 of the book of Philippians, he uses suffering as a motivation to get people to serve God. I don't think we'd use suffering as a motivation for most Christians today. I mean, you get to suffer for Jesus. Yeah, man, come on. Let's do it. We want to make life as easy as we can for ourselves. Why? Because we're going to stand before him. That's why we need to be so sold out to him. I read a story, or read not, not a full story, but it was a comment made by August J. Kling, a specialist on Columbus. You'll remember Columbus the man who's credited with discovering America. And yet when he left, he didn't know where he was going. When he got here, he didn't know where he was at. When he went back, he didn't know where he'd been. <laughs> but I'll tell you what, society today has painted a lot of false pictures about Columbus. Columbus was not a monster and is not the one who did a number of the things to the natives of the land. When he came here, as a Christian man, he would not have done those things. But here's what he said. Columbus' use of the Bible is one of the best documented facts of his remarkable career. But it is one of the least known to the general public. Columbus was a careful student of Scripture. He spoke Latin fluently. He knew enough Greek and Hebrew to exegete biblical words. All of Columbus' sailing journals give evidence of his biblical knowledge and his devout love for Jesus Christ. There is no denying that when Christopher Columbus set sail across the ocean blue, it was God, not gold or glory, that directed his course. He was not about the money. In his only book, Book of Prophecies, Columbus wrote, It was the Lord who put into my mind, I could feel his hand upon me, to sail from here to the Indies. I am a most unworthy sinner, 
But I have cried to the Lord for grace and mercy, and they have covered me completely. The fact that the gospel must still be preached in so many lands in such a short time, this is what convinces me. The reality is we have too much, and we've set our affections on things and money and worth instead of our dear Savior. He is worthy of all of our lives. See, we have two great commands. Seek the things that are above. Set your affections on things above. Two great commandments. We are dead, and our life is hid with Christ in God. Therefore, we have two great consolations. Christ shall appear, and when he does, we shall be with him. Let's pray. Father, we come to you in the name of the Lord Jesus. Dear God, stir our hearts tonight. If there's one here without Christ, I pray they'd come. Take the one who died for their sins at Calvary, was buried, rose three days later from the dead. I pray they'd come to Jesus by faith and receive his free gift of eternal life. I pray for Christians, Lord, that we'll get to that place where we not only seek the things that are above, but set our affections on the things that are above. Dear God, please deal with our hearts tonight. Have your way in our lives. I thank you. We've got one here for baptism tonight. And Lord, as we do that, we praise you for the salvation of that soul. And God, we thank you for the desire for obedience to the gospel of Christ. Now, Lord, deal with our hearts in Jesus' name.